Hey everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Jennifer Joyce, and I am the Vice President of North American Sales for Conducive. And uh, here with me today, I've got my partner in crime, Howard Butler. He is the Senior Director of Systems Engineering. A um, little bit about Howard, he is a 30 plus year veteran of our company, and uh, he's also an expert in the inner workings of the Windows operating system. Um, one other thing about Howard, too, is that he's also a race car driver and instructor. So he uh, specializes not only in helping computers go as fast as possible, but also cars. So if you ever get a chance to chat up, chat him up on that, definitely do that. Hey, Howard, how, how are you? Hey, Jennifer. Thanks very much. Really glad to be here. Although you stole my thunder, I was going to ask the audience to see if they could figure out which of us is really the true race car driver. <laughs> But anyway, um, glad to be here, Jennifer. One quick housekeeping note is that, uh, guys, we do want to make this an interactive webcast. So feel free to drop in your questions into the Q&A box and kind of as we go along, we'll answer them on the fly or towards the end during our Q&A session. So Jennifer, back over to you. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Howard. Uh, one other housekeeping item real quick is that we're going to divide today's webinar into two parts. And the first part, we're going to just really kind of treat as an executive briefing. We're going to cover real world use cases benchmarked with third party tools. Um, and you can kind of, I'll just go ahead and advance this here. You can kind of see some of the use cases we're going to be touching on. Uh, some of the environments may kind of overlap some of the tech you guys have there. And the second part, we're actually going to get into the technical briefing, which is really going to be the deep dive under the hood of exactly how we're doing what we do. Um, so we're going to hop into really focusing on, you know, two facets, two secrets that are going to help you gain 40% faster throughput from your Windows operating system and the whole environment sitting on the hardware that you already have. Uh, just a little bit about us. It's always good to know who you're talking to. Um, so I'm not going to spend much time on this, but it is good to know we are a 39-year-old software company. Uh, we are actually the 12th oldest software company in the world. And I also want to just kind of call out our partnerships, the Microsoft Gold Partner, VMware Tap Partner. Uh, we also have a SQL Server um, IO reliability certification, which is really hard to get, usually reserved only for the really big hardware vendors. We are the only software vendor uh, with that certification. In fact, Howard, you were on the team that worked with Microsoft to get us that certification, correct? Yep, that's exactly correct. And, uh, you know, I think it's a pretty big feather in our cap to be amongst the uh, uh, awesome group of hardware vendors uh, that were selected to participate. And, uh, you know, what we were bringing to the table is something that we'll talk about during the presentation today. Yeah, and and um, we'll also talk a little bit about one of the use cases here with our Citrix Ready certification. Now, you can see on the bottom of the slide our software publications. We're here today talking about Velocity. And actually, our next generation of both our Velocity and our Disk Keeper platforms is going to be migrating into a new release called Demaxio, which is on the cusp of coming out. Uh, so we're just going to be focusing on Velocity today. And some of you may be familiar with our Undelete product, uh, Software Data Recovery. Um, so we'll hop right into what we're talking about today, and really what we are looking at is the fact that the, you know, Windows is what we're talking about. Windows is everywhere. So you've had kind of this advent of what Windows can run in as far as con context, and we're obviously accelerating very much right now into the cloud, hyper-converged. Uh, we've had a lot of on-prem private cloud going for quite a while. Um, VDI is really coming into its own as well. The main thing that all of this has in common is the Windows operating system. Where it's being run, where it's being hosted is almost immaterial. What we want to get, though, is the fastest performance that we possibly can out of the hardware or the platform that we've chosen to host our Windows in. And that's what we're here to do. Because one thing that we can do is we can look at the any kind of an environment and we can look at every piece of it and try to make every single piece go faster. Now, one of the things that a lot of people lose sight of is the fact that the Windows operating system is in the image. This story came from one of our customers I was just speaking to recently. Uh, they have us deployed on 400 servers throughout their enterprise, and we were working with them on their VDI environment. It's a hospital, and they've got 4,000 clients and um, their hospital network. And they were getting all of these metrics back saying that their performance was could be a lot better. And so they went to the uh, software vendor that publishes the application this was running on, and they said, how can we do? How can we handle this without adding more hardware? Ironically, the answer back was, well, you could add more hardware. Um, and then they also got the answer, assess everything in the image. 
And as I was talking with the client about this, I said, well, you know, the Windows OS is in the image. And we both started kind of laughing because he knows what we were doing on their servers. And our product accelerates throughput by a minimum of 30 to 40 percent just by directly optimizing the Windows operating system. And most people don't op uh, optimize the Windows operating system simply because they don't know it can be done. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about. So I'm going to hop into the first use case here real quick. And when we're looking at this first use case, this is actually some of the testing, a piece of the testing that we did for our Citrix Ready certification. And you can see here that the uh, data transaction increased by 90%, and we had 60% more workload processed in the same amount of time. And we were using a third-party tool to do this benchmarking. Uh, this was done with Intel's Iometer tool. And so these metrics are directly from that third-party tool. So that was pretty impressive when we look at that in isolation. Uh, but what we want to talk about are two other concepts that I think are really important. And what I, I like to call these the two IO myths or the two IO fallacies. The first one is the IOPS fallacy. So this is the idea that, hey, I've got plenty of IOPS to handle the workload. In fact, where this kind of came to me one day was I was working with a, a client. They had come to us and they literally had an, an environment where they had an all flash pure SAN and they had 11 physical servers attached to it. They didn't even have any VMs. And this was so unusual that I remember the customer had to correct me like 12 times when I kept referring to them as VMs. It's like, no, no, they're physical. There's no hypervisor. So they have these 11 physical servers attached to this all flash pure sand that can push 600,000 IOPS. And they're using, scratching the surface of that. They're using maybe 3% of that IOPS capacity and they're still missing their SLAs. Um, and these SLAs were very time sensitive. They were in healthcare, had to, things had to run at midnight, be done by 5 a.m. They were running it to 7, 8 a.m. They threw our software on and it handled it. And they, they couldn't understand why they had all that hardware horsepower that our software would get the throughput to make them make their SLA. So that was a really interesting situation. And they, they kind of asked me about that. And so one of the things I kind of pointed out to them is that we really do have this workload drag, this performance drag from the Windows operating system itself that is completely independent of how hardware behaves. And the reason for this is because of split small random IO patterns generated by where, guess what, the Windows OS. And everything else is always having to compensate and, and overwork because of the way and the design of the pattern of data that Windows is sending out. Keep in mind that sequential IO always outperforms random IO. And we're only using a small percentage of that IO capacity at any one time. What we want to focus on is not that part, the, the headroom, giving us that false sense of security that we've got all the world, room in the world to, to get as much processing and as fast as we can. What we really need to focus on is the work being done. So a great example for this is if I walk into a room, I'm five foot three, I walk into a room and it's really crowded. It's got 20 foot ceilings and someone says, your job is to get from one side of the room to the other and don't touch anybody. And I can't do that. There's elbows everywhere, right? But I look up and there's 15 feet of space above me. Uh, it's not mission impossible. I don't have harnesses and wires. I can't use that headroom to get across uh, that space. I'm going to have to navigate through the five to six feet of space that's actually being used. So one solution is how do we optimize that space that's actually being used? That's what we come in and do. So that's the first IO fallacy. The second IO fallacy is what I like to call the IO response time fallacy, right? So IO response time can be really misleading. So the, the myth on this is that the faster the IO response time is, the better. Now, that's a true statement to a very large degree. Now, let me just work with me here and let me just drop that into the context of what I'm talking about. The reality is that each individual IO transfers at different speeds based on how big it is. So if you've got less KB per IO, that individual IO will go faster. If you've got more KB in an IO, it will go uh, slower, right? Just bigger payload, a little bit longer to transfer. So when we keep that in mind, we come back to how is the IO structured and how is it being issued from the source from the Windows operating system, which is right next to the application. We're still talking all logical here. We haven't gotten down to hardware yet. So what we're looking at is split versus contiguous IO and random versus sequential IO. Contiguous and sequential outperform every time. So if we can get Windows, instead of sending out split and random I.O., we can get it to send contiguous I.O. that will become more sequential than random, that's going to be the place that we want to live. So really when we're looking at it uh, kind of on this truth section is that the, the individual I.O. response time perhaps 
has been over prioritized. It's important. Sub millisecond IO response times will get you there all day long, but we can lose sight over the nature of the data that is being transferred, and you're going to get the faster performance if you can get rid of the small split random IO and move it to that contiguous larger sequential IO. So that's the conversation we're having today, and what I'd like to do right now is give you a break from how fast I talk. Howard talks a little slower than I do, uh, and have him take you through this first use case from one of our hospitals. And this environment is actually uh, a VMware Horizon 7 environment running VDI. You can kind of see the specs here. So Howard, let me go ahead and turn this over to you. And I find this really interesting, especially since this is um, uh, tested with VMware's VROPS with another third-party tool. Sure, Jennifer, thanks very much. So guys, let's take a quick look at what IO transformation with velocity can do. We're just going to kind of go through these slides kind of rather quickly, um, but feel free to toss some questions in there in case uh, anybody uh, has a, a few uh, things to comment about. The nice thing, as Jennifer mentioned, is that we can validate this with third-party tools, tools you probably already have in your environment, like VROPS, which is what we use at this particular hospital. And the orange lines represent you know, the, the data measurements with velocity, and we can see a pretty nice trend of improvement in write requests per second. So Jennifer, let's go on to the next slide. But wait, you know, kind of take a look at this now. What's up with the write latency? And this is exactly what Jennifer was talking about here, is that if this was the only metric that you looked at, you'd probably walk away thinking, gee, that velocity product seems to be slowing everything down. So like I said, this kind of ties back to what Jennifer was talking about in terms of IO response time myth. So now let's move forward and see what happens in the next, next metric. Whoa, 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 tap the brakes and get set up for a late apex turn here because you know, the write rate just shoots through the roof once velocity is enabled. So Jennifer, do me the favor, if you can go back to the previous slide. Sure. And again, take a look at the write latency. Sometimes the latency is perhaps maybe up to three times longer in some cases. Um, now let's go back to the write rate, Jennifer. And here we can see that the rate of data transfers are improving anywhere between two to six times. Okay, so this goes to show the power of focusing on the overall throughput of data and not over focusing on individual IO response time. So now let's go ahead and see what's, what happens on the next slide. Okay, so we can see something pretty similar here on read latency looks like it got uh, a bit longer. Um, so now let's take a look at the next slide. As I said, the rate read rate just kills it. It's off the charts in terms of the amount of data throughput that is occurring in the environment. And, you know, guys, that's kind of what we really tend to focus on is how much data can you push or pump through the system, okay? So let's take a look at the next slide. And I just want to throw in one more metric here, just in, in case it makes difference to, to anybody there, is the disk usage. And I think this picture pretty much speaks for itself. And let me just mention here, it isn't always about end user experience. Now, naturally, of course, it does come down to that. But why do you have your existing virtual server or VDI density count set the way it is today. That is because of user experience. So when you do install Velocity, it really wouldn't be valid to go back and ask users, hey, did you notice anything going faster? You've already managed that end user experience by scaling down your density today. So think of this, with Velocity installed, you can scale back up and still keep the end user experience at its optimum level, not to mention the fact that you're able to keep existing hardware 
for an extra year or even longer period of time, sweat that hardware asset before having to do any type of, of major upgrades. So if we move on to the next slide, thanks very much, Jennifer. Now, I did wanna to touch on one more point here about how important this concept of IO transformation is. And I will go into greater detail during our technical briefing portion of the event today. But just look at it, looking at it from a high level and to kind of sum it up, this is what we want to have happen to the right IOs. We take those split, small, random IOs and transform them, transform them into contiguous, larger sequential IOs. That is the key in getting back 30 to 40% of your throughput. You know, think of this, your hardware should be able to perform faster than it is today. But the way Windows is handling the data logically, it's kind of like Windows got its foot on the brake. You know, you're driving this hot rod Maserati, think of velocity as pressing down on the accelerator. So now let's take a look at our third case. Now, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this one, um, but it is another Horizon environment running on a all pure flash storage array, again, tested with VROPS. And these numbers are for, from a Fortune 500 company. In fact, it's one of those household named cable companies. And this was a sampling from their call center. And disk usage rate is definitely significantly better more than double in most cases. And when we take a look at the commands per second, these two also improve significantly. Again, more than double in most cases. And when we take a look at the average number of write requests, we can see that across the board, every system realized a significant increase in activity. It's data throughput. And with the write rate kilobytes per second, shows the average number of kilobytes written to the disk each second, we can see that across the board, every system realized a significant increase in activity. And this would tie back to velocity, transforming those small split random IOs and helping Windows generate larger, more contiguous and sequential data streams being sent out to storage. And here in this, this last slide here, we have the read rate kilobytes per second, showing the average number of kilobyte reads from each disk each second. And we can realize a significant increase, again, in activity and throughput. Okay, so I got two more cases to show you and then we'll get into the technical briefing portion. Um, and this one we just wrapped up, one of our existing customers has us deployed to a tier one electronic medical records application that was isolated on its own cluster, okay? And they just recently expanded us to all 200 servers in their enterprise cluster all at once. And I'll just kind of mention something there, that helps illustrate just how easy it is to deploy our software either through our built-in management console or however you wanna package it up and use with SCCM or other type of deployment tools. Think of us as really, it's just a, uh, an MSI installer file, it requires no reboot to install. So you can literally push it out on the fly. Now, back to this particular case. In this case, they deployed us to all 200 enterprise servers in one shot. Literally, it took us less than 30 minutes, okay? And a global deployment like this is truly, truly the only time you can measure at the storage hardware level. Because if you just do one or two systems here and expecting a miracle, um, you're not really going to see that show up on the storage side of things because all the other systems that are tied into that infrastructure are not being optimized. So again, when you do this universal type of deployment, hitting all Windows VMs at once, this is where you can really see the benefit of a universal IO transformation. 
and we were pretty methodical about the testing. These are perf miles, perf mon style type of counters that we've listed here. And it really shows the importance um, of performance, which is the throughput. And these were collected, again, using the HPE InfoSight tools, pointing directly at their Nimble storage array. So let's kind of dig in under the hood a little bit and take a look at the numbers. Um, and here we can see both the max and average values of one indiv individual server as benchmarked from the Nimble storage perspective. Nimble's a fantastic platform. Love them, work with them for years, and you know they provide an incredible performance boost just all on their own. But every customer we've talked to who uses Nimble simply loves their product and sees the added value that we bring on top of their uh, hardware environment. Uh, and these numbers are, you know, could be thinking of just astronomical, a bit shocking. The reason we get this is because it's not the hardware's fault. The hardware's working just fine. It's Windows. And Velocity fixes the problem right at the source, inside of Windows. Okay? Most people don't think about that because we're all geared and used to the idea of you want to improve performance, well, you change the hardware. Well, as Jennifer says, you know, I'm a race car driver. I dig into the weeds and I try to figure out how I can literally outperform my competitor by taking advantage of certain things under the hood. So that's a way of looking at where velocity is providing benefit. Now, if we look at this next slide here, we can see, take a quick look at a second server from the same test group. Again, these numbers speak for themselves. Okay, Jennifer, so you know, let's look at this last server case. And I think this is our fifth and final, final use case. This again was tested in a load balanced Citrix terminal server kind of environment. And the customer picked 10 systems to install Velocity on, and then a different 10 systems kind of to be used as a control group. And the customer tested using vSphere, sent us the data back uh, so we could you know, analyze and look at it and compare their numbers and see what was happening there. And we both concluded that there would have been a 32% improvement in reads and there was an 18% improvement on writes. So this kind of wraps up those use cases. I hope this information, guys, was really helpful for you. So Jennifer, I'm gonna turn it back over to you now. Great, thank you, Howard. Really appreciate you taking through all of that information for us. Sure. Um, yeah, it's really good stuff. And, um, you know, so you guys are kind of probably hearing a common theme here. Um, a lot of the stuff that we hear from people is just, you know, better application performance, uh, increasing density, um, the throughput. It's all about the throughput. That's really what it comes down to. And in SQL, we hear a lot about reduced timeouts and crashes. Um, and Howard touched on as well, extending the hardware lifecycle. So there's really a lot to to be done here. And you know, one of the one of the really interesting ones just at the top of the slide here, Krista's health. Um, in fact, uh, just got was just in touch with them this morning. Uh, they are fully deployed on almost 2,000 VMs throughout their data center, and they're about to start deploying to their entire VDI cluster, um, supporting their EMR and their their medical operations. Um, really incredible. They had originally come in uh, with performance issues, and we're looking at a two million dollar uh, you know, forklift upgrade on some hardware threw us in first when they were looking for solutions. It fixed it within a week and they were able to keep the existing hardware on the floor for another 18 months. And now they weren't my account when that happened. And so I, when I finally uh, started working with them directly, I met with them at VMworld at dinner a couple of years back and I asked them, was that true? And they said every word of it. Uh, so that's a published case study on our website. And we actually have about 20 case studies on our website. So if you want to check that out, uh, please do. But really just, we hear it time and time again, just a different result from people. Now, how can you explore this in your own environment? Uh, we do offer a free proof of concept where you can actually get trialware. It's full functioning trialware, 30 days. And uh, we will do a pre-POC consultation with you, about a 15-minute call, uh, see if it's a good fit or not. We also have a pre-assessment tool that 
takes about 10 minutes to set up that you can run against your servers to see if they're even good candidates. Um, and then we'll actually conduct the POC if it looks like your environment is a good candidate for the software. And then we'll do a review with you after the fact. And there's kind of the steps I just said verbally. We'll hop right into the technical briefing now. Um, so what we want to talk about now is now that you know what, what we can do and the benefits we can provide, how do we do it? So this is a really rudimentary extraction of a virtual environment. And I mean, I love virtualization, as I'm sure we all do. It's been incredible for cost savings and efficiencies. But there is a really big downside to virtualization, and that is that it does add a lot of complexity to the data path. Uh, so this is what your IO stream ends up looking like. And now, this is where the two really severe inefficiencies co come in ca causing this. One is just the Windows I.O. tax with that behavior we've been referring to of Windows breaking files down into much smaller pieces than they need to be, getting that small split randomized data pattern. Uh, the second problem then is the what, a term we coined with Gartner a while back, you probably heard it by now, is the I.O. blender effect, and that's the randomization of data in this shared environment, in this shared footprint. Now, it's good that we can come in and we can actually prevent Windows from behaving like that going forward. And we'll talk about that engine in just a moment. There are two key engines we're going to talk about. But one of the things that we get asked a lot is, hey, when you're doing that, can I just do it on this one server? Yes, you can. And that one server will be optimized and it may solve the issue. But it may not. And the reason is because of that IO blunder effect. This would be your most ideal usage of Velocity. Uh, in fact, we make that really easy to do. You can license it by VM, you can license it by host, but we also offer site license, which gives you universal deployment across the entire site for any Windows asset that would be physical or virtual, desktop or server, BDI, really doesn't matter. So you can really accomplish this with those licensing offers that we have. One really interesting story that just kind of illustrates this perfectly is we have a customer um, that is in the financial services industry. And I'm just going to back this up a couple slides. They had this going on and they had, they had 120 SQL servers on a six host cluster. And one of those was supporting a customer. Well, each server was for a different client. One of those SQL servers was supporting a particular customer and they were missing this monthly SLA. And every time they missed this SLA, it cost them a $10,000 bill back off of that customers invoice every month. It was very expensive SLA to be missing. So they wanted to do that. They deployed just to the one server. We told them it wasn't going to work because of the IO Blender effect, but go for it and then let's expand later. So that's exactly what happened. It did not make the SLA that month. The next month, they agreed to deploy to their 10 busiest servers. They actually made the SLA by three minutes the next month. Then they uninstalled the software. They missed the SLA again by five minutes expensive got their attention and so they agreed to go to all of the servers and when they did that they got into 119 of the 120 servers don't know what happened with the last one but we didn't get to it they made the sla by 17 minutes yes that was a four-month poc but they had crazy change control and it was perfect uh you know on and off kind of an experiment to really show the power of getting rid of that io blender effect so it's really powerful one of the things that we want to really kind of consider here as we're looking at this is exactly where velocity is sitting. And this is really important, right? So we are sitting that orange bar right inside the Windows operating system and we're fenced by Windows. This is why we can be universal. This is why at the very beginning I was talking about whether it's physical, private cloud, public cloud, wherever that Windows instance is sitting, it does not matter. This behavior is happening inside of Windows. So we install inside of Windows to fix it. So we can, you can port us anywhere you want. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that this is really top of the stack. So where the where the IO is getting originated from and then having to cascade everywhere downstream, everything downstream is having to use those valuable resources to overwork. You're probably not going to use more than 10% of the IOPS on that big SAN, but how you're using that 10% is really important. And coming back to that IO transformation that Howard was talking about earlier, you want to transform that IO before everyone else downstream has to touch it. So that's where we're sitting. And then the last point on this slide is compatibility. Because we are fenced by Windows and we're not trying to interact with any other level in any environment, we're compatible with everything. Think about it this way. There isn't a special flavor of Windows for Nutanix or Windows for Dell or Windows for Hyper-V. It's just Windows or Windows for VMware. It's just Windows. And so everything has to be compatible with Windows as are we. So that makes us compatible with the full environment, which is really nice. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, 
just the write optimization and the read optimization and then our reporting. So the first engine of how we do this is going to be called IntelliWrite. Now I'm going to cover this off really high level. Please start dropping questions into the question box if you have any, but I don't think we need to dive too deeply into this. It's, it's a pretty simple concept. Basically, Windows is breaking files down we don't let it anymore. So instead of a break fix of having to go and clean all that mess up after the fact, we're actually able to just get Windows to write files the correct way the very first time. I kind of like to use a, a kind of a childhood story, the egg on the wall, breaks, falls, all the King's men come back, try to put that egg together. That's really the break fix model. We're not doing that. We just don't let that egg or AKA the file break and fall in the first place. We get Windows to issue it clean the first time. How it writes is how it reads. So you get a clean write, you get a clean read back. This is where you're getting that 40% plus faster throughput because the data has been transformed and it's organized and it's transferring how it should. And what this means on average, if you wanna just look at the number of IOs it takes to transfer data, this means on average a reduction of 30% of all IO. This is how you could look at it. If it takes about an average of 100,000 IOs to transfer one gig of data, Reduce that down to 70,000 IOs. Get rid of 30,000 IOs off the, just skim it off of every gig of data that has to go through and multiply that across all of the workload you're doing every single day. It is a significant reduction in IO and the IO that's left has been transformed. It's larger and it's sequential and your throughput is gonna go out the roof. The second engine that layers on top of that is what we call IntelliMemory. This is our DRAM read caching engine. And this is really interesting uh, technology as well. Now, this is where we're going to start leveraging some memory. We do not use any memory on the write engine. That's all passed through. This, we're only going to be caching reads. And Howard, let me actually tap you on the shoulder to explain a little bit about how we're using that memory. Because I know a lot of people instantly kind of go, ooh, yeah, you know, I'm not sure about that. I know SQL hogs a lot of memory. Are you? How much do you need? And are you using it? In a, in a, and I'm going to get into a memory starvation situation. So Howard, maybe I could ask you to speak to those kind of common questions that we get real quick. Sure. Thanks very much, Jennifer. So guys, you know, this is an an animated visual uh, that I put together to help describe or show you how Velocity dynamically adjusts its memory usage to only using free available memory that would otherwise be idle and unused anyway. Um, it's also intelligent enough to know when there is a demand for memory by other applications, including Windows, SQL, what have you, and release memory from its cache. So there's never going to be a shortage of free memory, and this will allow or keep Windows and other applications happy. So, you know, one of the things that we've discovered a long time ago is that most systems are not utilizing 100% of their resources all the time. And that we've discovered that many systems have, I don't want to necessarily say an overabundance of, of free memory, but do have memory that they're not currently making use of. What a great free available resource for us to dynamically use and put it to good use. Allow us to satisfy those frequently requested repetitive reads directly from memory. So the storage system isn't having to waste its time processing that type of data. And then if that memory is needed, we back out of the picture and give that memory back to Windows. So it's no harm, no foul. Thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, thanks, Howard. So I think you could kind of consider this like a tier zero cache strategy. And I mentioned that the other engine is going to just off the top take 30% of the IO out of the picture. This engine on the read IO is going to take another 20% of the read IO and serve it directly from memory. And you've got that, you know, much faster transfer, memory to memory data transfers than even going down to a flash layer uh, on your SAN. So really a lot of benefit here, especially when you combine the two engines. And we're just going to wrap up here with the last couple slides. Um, I like this slide a lot. This is a VMware, uh, directly from VMware's documentation. They talk about disk IO performance enhancements, and they do two things here. It's a little bit of a tiny thing. I'll just summarize. The first one says, they hey, hey, increase the virtual machine memory. This should allow the operating system to cache more. 
we all know that's not going to happen. It's already, already got plenty of memory. It's not actually caching more. The point here is that they're saying offload as much memory as you can, as much read traffic as you can. Do, get something caching it directly from memory on that VM. You're going to just get that IO out of the ecosystem, serve it directly from memory, and that IO doesn't have to consume resources making the round trip. That's what our DRAM read caching in telememory does. Number two, defragment the file systems on all guests. No one's going to defragment today. That's just not going to happen. Uh, but they are acknowledging the fact that the fragmentation that exists in the Windows operating system is still a problem. That's where our IntelliWrite en uh, engine comes in, and that's where, you know, don't let the egg break in the first place, just get a clean write out the gate. So we're really in line with an enterprise class solution that's highly compatible with environments. Um, and just a quick, um, quick thing that I'll mention as well is when you deploy our software, there is no reboot required. Uh, it is, a, as Howard mentioned earlier, it's an MSI file. You can just deploy it. If, you, if you've got a kind of a non-persistent VDI environment, you just throw it right into the master image. Um, you can just deploy it with our console or other things. So it's extremely easy to deploy. This is what the console, uh, one of the UI screenshots looks like. You basically have um, great IO reduction that you can see. You can see your storage IO time saved. We have centralized reporting from our console. And uh, that's about it, guys. So we wanted to make sure that we were able to cover, and we covered an awful lot today. We did go about six minutes over. Really appreciate all of you sticking in with us. Um, I'm going to just check and see if we had any questions. Um, and I actually, let me see if I can see if there's any questions in there. It looks like there are, and I have to expand my window so I can read them. Give me one second. Howard, I'm actually not being able to get into the question box, but I know that some of the co the common type of stuff that we're asked, we usually we've actually already answered a lot of that in the presentation. How do you install it? Where does it install? Um, no reboot required. So, Howard, unless there's anything else that you would like to add on for our audience today, I think we can go ahead and wrap it up. No, I didn't see any additional questions there. Um, maybe you can just elaborate a little bit about how to get in touch with us and how to, how they can get their hands on a um, uh, a proof of concept. Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, our team members will be reaching out to you via email and also phone call um, to go ahead and schedule you if you would like to have a proof of concept. The software trial is free. And again, like I said, we will um, just hop on a very quick 15 minute call with you. We can give you that pre assessment tool, uh, which is called the conducive IO assessment tool. There may be some questions around that, so I'll just explain that briefly. Um, that tool will does not require you to install anything on your targets. It uses remote WMI calls to get existing perfmon counters off your target servers, and then it puts it into a nice interface that you can see, and you can also send to us and we can see. It will tell us if your servers are candidates for this or not, if your Windows operating system in combination with the applications that you're running on those are gonna be good candidates. So that's a perfect place to start. It takes about 10 minutes to set up. You let it run for a couple of days, and then we can come back and let you know they're good or they're not. Uh, from there, it, we can go for a proof of concept if it makes sense. Um, Howard, did I leave anything off? No, I think you covered it really well. Thank you very much, okay. Jennifer. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone again for attending, and our team will be in touch with you. And uh, thank you very much. All righty. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.